destroyed, it'll fall off. That would be super hilarious. Actual duct tape like the banana. <laughs> That's right, the banana with the duct tape. Okay. Like I can literally duct tape it right here. I could put like a strap. My guitar on this side. We're just we're just parallel versions of each other. And I'm yeah, sure exactly. you have some like Hindu or Buddhist sculptures in your background too, just like yeah, my somewhere in there. there is. This will be so funny. Right That'll be so funny. I think we should do it. <laughs> Hold on a second. Let me just want to make sure it doesn't break. We're live, the balls. Michael. We're live. <laughs> oh, we're already on the air. We're already on the air. We're a couple of jokers. Oh, okay. Well, that's too late. I was gonna for all of you. No, 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 no. Go, go, go do it. You already said you're gonna oh, do it. Just go ahead. Okay. Our viewers, hey, our, go viewers ahead don't, our viewers don't want to lose out here. So everybody, this is what's going on. I, I asked Michael here because we, I really want to talk about protocol moving forward. Um, protocol I run to the forward. beach, I run to the beach and some people are wearing masks and some people aren't. And you can see the judgment in some people's eyes and other, other people going, you're ridiculous to be wearing a mask. I have friends who are about to start meeting up in person in homes, not just outside, but like inside locations as of this coming weekend. And they're Ooh. apparently they're taking things less seriously than other people, including myself. And you're saying I, there's a is a, there's a barbecue planned? And am I invited? <laughs> I could get you invited if you if you were brave enough to go. But I don't know I don't know how to assess. And I love these people and they're not fools by any stretch, but how do we assess what is, what is safety? What is a, a, an appropriate level of safety protocol? And um, that would be good if, if people- We're gonna be talking about masks, to say. am I right? <laughs> That's yes. the wrong way. Masks are coming in. So I've got my, I've got my little mask here to show. Um, now, just in case you all thought we were very serious epidemiologists, we're not. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm a very serious uh, epidemiologist. However, we are going to give you some data from, um, from, from some very scientific sources as our backing for our logic. Now, that doesn't mean yeah. you should follow our we, logic. Exactly. No, not necessarily. This don't is follow an open our forum, protocols, right? but we're just trying, I want to establish a, a, a set of protocols from which you could go, oh, that's a good, that's a decent framework. I think it's too risky, or I think it's not, it, I think it's too safe, like, too, like extreme. Um, but we would, I just want to establish a full set of protocols so the people who haven't necessarily thought this through as well as they could have the opportunity to think it through better than we have. Um, Andrew, can you explain, when you say protocol, this afternoon when we were talking about this, I feel like you had a really good, um, we had a good discussion about why we need this protocol. And because yeah. um, like the, some of the psychological benefits almost. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because yeah. you explained it well. Absolutely. So this can't go on the way it's going. Like I've been isolated for like nine weeks. I see my mother. I see some people on Zoom. But I'm, I'm, I'm reaching my limits. I'm no introvert. And I'm really not comfortable with this. And I'm sure a lot of people are dealing with worse depression and eating and binging and just addiction issues because we're we're like rats you know in in the the famous experiment with the cocaine water when a when a rat was left in the cage with no toys and no friends they drank the cocaine water till it killed them when that same rat was given friends and toys and he wouldn't touch the cocaine water he drank the regular water and so i think about us that way too like you know in isolation in social deprivation, we are more prone to our addictions than ever, and it's just not healthy. We're hyper-social creatures. And, and so this is gonna break at some point. We're gonna have a breaking point, all of us, at a certain point, unless you're super introverts. That looks great. I hope I don't hit the breaking point of this duct tape. <laughs> so um, basically, I think that we need to come up with some sort of um, protocol levels that are comfortable so that when we talk to other people about whether we're going to meet with them and take take the risk of being in an enclosed atmosphere with friends who are um alexa shut up <laughs> no alexa he doesn't mean you you're fine <laughs> if we're gonna take the risk of being in an enclosed space with others who may or may not be you know, passively 
um, shedding something that they don't know that they have, um, we're going to want to minimize the risk. We're going to want to have um, a minimal risk when we meet up with those people. And yeah, we're going to want to pick only a, su a few number of people that we're going to do that with. Because if we're just doing this with everybody well, then the, you know, then it just, it, it increases the odds of, of things being spread around. But yeah. And I don't know if you, wanna... I don't know if you address this, but also sort of like the social shame factor, like you kind of all want to be in the same, in the same boat in the sense that you don't want to feel like you're responsible for someone's grandmother dying. I mean, right. we should all share the responsibility of that. And it shouldn't be that there's a weak link or a, right. a perceived weak link. Right. I mean, so, so, I'm, so I'm essentially having meals regularly with my mother, who's in her mid-60s. And um, so we're, we're exchanging airborne whatever on a, on a regular base, basis. If I go to this party this weekend or some other mm. gathering and other people's protocol are much lower than my threshold or my mother's threshold, then that means I'm probably, it's, it's more likely I'm bringing more risk to her than she's willing to take. And that I can't afford. So that's why I'm right. unlikely to go to this, this party this weekend, even though I'd really like to. Um, uh, mm. And of course, it's, it's not just the seniors. It's, the seniors are more, you know, more likely to have problems, but everybody's right. potentially at risk. People have been Everyone having some thoughts risk, yeah. and other weird things have happened to young people that, you know, that are related to COVID. So it's not, it's not just any, anyone, you know, it's going to, it's going to affect us all if uh, pretty badly, if anyone is hospitalized or dies because of our actions or inactions. So I just thought this is an important time knowing that people are moving forward, that things are going back into some, you know, new version of an economy. We need to think about how we're going to approach um, our, our work lives and our social lives in a, in a, in a more, um, in a, in a, in a good way that we're not thinking about it all the time too. If we set up a protocol like, Oh, this is a good standard of safety. Then we don't have to constantly be thinking about it and be fearful and nervous. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, am I downwind of that person? It's like, it's like, no, like I've got my protocol established. It makes sense. I, I, I trust it, you know? Yeah. I agree. That's good. So let's get down to talking about some protocols. All right. So mm -hmm. I guess the, the number, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 go, you go ahead. Well, I was going to say, let's start with masks. That seems like probably the, the, the biggest hot button item. Well, or, I, uh, I think before we talk about masks, I want to show people and you, you, you feel free to talk about this, but I'm going to just click, I want to share screen share the article here by Aaron Bromage, which I found Fruity and Bromage. Now, Bromage is a is is a PhD um, with some. Uh, what's the, what's the, um, yeah, epidemiological background, but mostly um, that epidemiological background is mostly veterinary. So just just to establish that, <laughs> um, mostly veterinary, mostly veterinary. But this article, the risks, know them, avoid them. Can you see that, Michael? Yeah. This is, uh, this is a pretty cool article. Now, um, I'll just show you down below. This is, this is the bio of Aaron Bromage, um, PhD, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. That's an Ivy League school. Uh, graduated from School of Veterinary and Biomedical Sciences, James Cook University, Australia, where his research focused on epidemiology of and immunity to infectious disease in animals. Um, postdoctoral training, College William and Mary, Virginia Institute of Marine Science and the Com Comparative Immunology Laboratory of Lake Stephen Katari. So do, there's some, there's some uh, scientific background this person has that, that relates to this pretty well. And all this person really does is draw from, from current uh, other experts and from actual examples of what COVID has already done in major spreads. And so, but I want to establish first that there's this, um, there's this idea here that's been posited that 
Some experts estimate that as few as 1,000 SARS-CoV-2 infectious viral particles are all that will be needed to, to cause a, tri a reaction in the body. So there's an Does that idea. Mean, like that many particles ingested? Yeah, I think it, it has to get okay. into, the, into the lungs, basically, is the, the weak point. So that's the idea is that... If As opposed that, to there, there being that many particles like in the room, say, when somebody sneezes. I, right. I assume there's probably billions. There's got to be way more particles in the room, right. So essentially, <laughs> if there's a thousand uh, uh, RNA strands of, of, of SARS-CoV-2 in your that get into your system that's when it's that's the threshold for reaction is, is what some experts are, are claiming now we can't confirm or deny this i have no idea how that science works but that that changed my thinking about all of this because as he says here a thousand infectious viral particles you receive in one breath so in other words if someone's like coughing in your face you could get a thousand viral particles right in your nose you know in, in, real quick um, or you, you, some spittle gets on your hand and then you rub your eye, that could give you a thousand virus, viral particles. Or hmm. a, a hundred vir viral particles inhaled with each breath over 10 breaths, or 10 viral particles with a hundred breaths. Huh. So basically this, is, this, this understanding leads you, to under, leads you to think that even if you've got very low viral load exposure, if you're in the environment, that's, that's bringing in a lot of this viral exposure, over time you could get enough to have a reaction. And it's kind of like you need to get to this critical threshold. This, I mean, they're calling it a thousand particles. And uh, I wonder where they get that, because I, I, that's something I'm curious about. Uh, but that's a good, I guess, assumption to work with, is there is some, there is some threshold after which the virus will have taken hold and will begin it's chain reaction inside of you. Right, right. Okay. So, so I'll just go up a little bit more here. So um, single, they say a single cough can release a 3,000 droplets, um, which can travel at 50 miles per hour. <laughs> um, most of them will fall to, to the ground because of gravity, um, but some of them stay in the air and travel across the room in a few seconds. Does um, this guy explain how this gravity works? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a that's a conspiracy theory. See, <laughs> see appendix A for gravity explanation. <laughs> so, so um, it says here uh, a sneeze a sneeze may contain as many as two hundred million viral particles. Oh damn! Sneeze is putting all cops to shame. Yeah, that, that's like a that's like a bomb. That's like a bomb that could you know affect a whole group of people, <laughs> and and they shoot at incredible speeds too. Wait, how like, fast? You told us how fast the cough went. A single oh, sneeze, two hundred miles per hour. Two hundred miles per hour. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, we need so now a single breath can release five fifty to five thousand droplets. Now droplets is not viral particles, mind you. That's just droplets. So a, a droplet can contain many. Thousands of viral particles? No, or? no. What, what I'm gathering is, and he says here below, studies have shown that a person infected with influenza can release up to 33 infectious viral particles per minute. So it's far oh, less. Oh, wow. That's okay. That's a lot less than I would have imagined. Somehow yeah. I thought it was, you know, this, like, a, almost like a cloud of virus particles. Right. Now, we're going to see that it, it, it can be cloud-like. And that's what's... Like in the case of a sneeze? Yeah, or, or even just heavy breathing or whatever over time. Mm. And I want to, let me just switch to that real quick. Um, switch to is, heavy breathing? Yeah, this is the article that this person, that Bromage was inspired on this article by um, Thomas Hale, associate professor at Oxford. Well, what a handsome fellow he is. And this is one of the examples of how it spreads in a, in a restaurant. So this is the one infected person in this restaurant, A1. This per the air conditioner is over here blowing in this direction. What what happened? Four of the people at their table got infected. Three of the people on the table behind this person, meaning that he, he was speaking this way, air blew his particles over to these people and this people. And then are you sure we're not? Are you sure we're not looking at an overhead of the Kennedy assassination? <laughs> <laughs> I think the bullet was traveling like this, and then it went, it went across the room, bounced off this wall, hit C1 and C2. 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you see that no one on this side of the room got infected. Now this is consistent with some other models that they show in this other article when it comes to, um, to, the, to your office. Your office environment can have, um, this, is, this is an example of what happened in an office. Um, and essentially, the person was working on this side of the office, and you can see a ton of people on this side of the office got infected in just one day and a few people on the other side of the office, but mostly it was in the airflow realm of these employees. So going back to work is something you should very, very carefully think about um, because one person can, can spread this significantly, especially in a, an enclosed mm. space where the airflow is, the air, air circulation is not sufficient to disperse and expel the, the, the viral particles. Um, so this is, this is now, I'm going to get to one more example, just be quick here. Um, uh, they said that the meat, the reason we're having meat shortages is because the meat packing plants are the most severe, partly because mm. they're cold, um, cold environments, and partly because they are, um, here it is, is meat. They're meat, closely meat packed together, probably. Yeah, and people are close together. There's not a lot of air circulation. So... There have been 115, there have been outbreaks in 115 facilities across the 23 states mm. um, with 5,000 plus workers infected already. This, this article came out several weeks ago. So this is, so you do not want to be working in a meatpacking plant right now. <laughs> yeah. And I heard, um, uh, can I say something? Yeah. They, um, I, I heard a discussion today about how either, even the volume of your voice can sort of make a difference in how many particles you're emitting like if you're in a in a loud environment and you have to speak up and project you i mean you could be projecting this is perfect. 10 times as many um now this is particles. perfect what you say it's perfect lead into the last example i want to show you which is the choir mm -hmm. in, in washington state the community choir in washington state i'm going to read this even though people were aware of the virus and took steps to minimize transfer e.g they avoided the usual handshakes and hugs hello People also brought their own music to avoid sharing and socially distanced themselves during practice, meaning they were all six feet apart. They even went to the lengths to tell choir members prior to practice that anyone experiencing symptoms should stay home. A single asymptomatic carrier infected most, people of the, of the pe most of the people in attendance. The choir sang for two and a half hours. There's your problem right there. So that's your problem right there. For four days in a row in an, in an enclosed space the size of a volleyball court. With, with, without sufficient air circulation. 45 of the 60 people caught it and two of them died. Mm. The youngest infected was 31. So this is, so anyway, this, this, is, this is the main thing. Now they, I want to They averaged 67, okay. They, they averaged 67. It was an older So mostly the older, older people group. were the ones really catching it or aware that they were catching it. Um, now birthdays and funerals, similar situation, not enough air airflow and, and too many people and too much buildup and droplets. Now let me show you one little video that also helps you understand how serious this is. This is a video of particles coming out of your breath. All right, let me show that again. So there's a let huge- Let me show that again. There's a huge dispersion. <clears throat> and I'm gonna show you one more thing. So there are, there are two types of, of ways this, this shoots. And this guy named Flug from 140 years ago, uh, Flug, Fluge, hmm. um, was a scientist who discovered how these, these particles transfer. And he says most of them are these like ballistic droplets that fire out of the mouth or nose um, while speaking, sneezing, coughing, <clears throat> or labored breathing. And these droplets carry the most because they because they can be substantial in size. Those are those droplets, however, will be blocked by a mask, most likely because they're 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 big enough. However, there is a lingering cloud of tiny aerosol droplets can be found as well, and they can be a dominant mode of trans transmission because they go right through masks. And so your your mask, even a great mask, isn't gonna isn't gonna filter out all of the aerosolized particles, which is why being in an office environment or some sort of enclosed environment for a long period of time is probably just not a good idea, um, even if you're wearing a mask. 
Um, and I've got a video here to show you just a little bit but of that. The high sensitivity camera. So, this, so there's a high sensitivity camera. So, so all this remaining stuff in the air after the gunshot of the sneeze. Mm. And they're small and light. You can see them drifting. It's a cloud. It's a cloud of vapor, essentially. And the particles, the particles are really too small to, um, to be blocked by most masks. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not reduced by masks. And that's why, the, and they are, they clearly are. It's most important, as, as Anthony Fauci said, to wear a mask to stop your spreading of the viral particles to other people. And that is the most effective way for a mask to work. Even a, a, mm. a lousy cotton mask will reduce how much is coming out. Yeah, yeah, you'd think so. It probably confines a lot of those fluga particles right to the mask area. Right. For one thing. And the fluga particles, too, it would block other people's fluga particles from coming in, mostly. Although I can imagine them sort of absorbing in, and then eventually you're getting a little bit of vapor as your mask kind of gets foggy or something like but but yeah. mostly you're, you're you're minimizing it that's my understanding so so now that we're establishing sort of the ground the groundwork of, of what we think is going on how do we establish good protocols uh, of safety going forward that we can sort of uh, automate mm -hmm. yeah so well for one um, should we all be wearing a mask or have one at least with us all the time, essentially, in public? I think it's a good idea. Like, I go to the beach without a mask. And for a while, I was concerned about people's, like, air vapor near me. And then after I studied this article and read a few more things, I just kind of got to feel like it's very, the idea of me walking by somebody, even who's breathing heavy, as long as they don't spit on me or, or cough mm -hmm. on me. Yeah, the, the, the amount of viral load coming from a person I'm just passing is going to be so minimal that the probability of me catching something is almost, almost, no. almost impossible. Yeah. And so now I do right runs to the beach with no mask and I don't care. But if I bumped into somebody I wanted to talk to, then, and we're talking at each other, that's mask time, right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's not mask a time. time. That's yeah. mask time. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, I've been, I guess I've been doing sort of the same. I started actually, I made, I made this mask and I don't know how Ooh, that's sexy. Uh, protective it is, but it, it does have a good fit over my face because I got a, an underwire in here. It's like an underwater bra. Underwire bra <laughs> for your nose? <laughs> got to hold up my heavy nose. <laughs> that was not an anti-Semitic remark. <laughs> how dare you? <laughs> This yeah, heavy nose it. holds itself up, I'll have you know. <laughs> so my mask is cotton, but I have in it a little, um, one of these little jobbies. Oh, maxi pad, nice. <laughs> I hear those are the best filters. It's a PM... Oh, PM 2.5, all right. It's supposed right. to, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a few layers thick and it's supposed to, it's supposed to help. So I put it inside, I cut a slit in the mask and I, I take it, I, I can wash this and I can just air this in the sun and then reuse. That's nice. So I've been where I've lately I've been putting it on like this, even when, if I'm just going for like a walk, cause I, I go for a walk in the neighborhood or to the beach almost every day, I would say. Um, and you know, I don't feel like I'm encountering people and I keep my distance. I if I'm like, I, I walk in the street a lot more I've noticed now uh, just like it's easier to like navigate it, it's a quiet residential neighborhood uh, but if I can I kind of just like I'm always like looking for an out for like handling potential um, I mean I feel like everyone's doing that am I crazy on that uh, like when you're walking you sort of like chart a path for how you're gonna like avoid the person coming at you yeah I yeah I do that I, I watch, I kind of watch myself and I, <clears throat> I avoid too much, um, too much exposure. Yeah, yeah. And just getting too close to, and I, I feel like almost everybody is doing that who I'm seeing. Um, 
Uh, so yeah, I have the mask with me. And then I've been noticing we've been having some really windy days here lately. And I was like, hmm, is that wind? Like, is there a chance that like a crowd of people over there can like send particles upwind my direction? Can we have, can we have a call from the doctor to uh, talk about the risk level of that one? Or we're we just gonna have to speculate it ourselves. Probably the wind is like drying, air is like evaporating the particles as they travel, especially on a sunny day. So you'd think if, like they probably can't travel that, that far. Yeah, and I, you know, it's funny because I was so initially so concerned about the, the particles um, coming at me when if I was downwind and I, I still have been thinking about it a little bit, but now it's, I, I kind of think it's more, if you're in that open air environment and there's a breeze, I think that the particles are gonna disperse pretty rapidly. And so the mm. viral load's gonna be pretty small, even if I'm downwind of somebody. That doesn't yeah. mean coughing or sneezing is okay. And I mean, that's, that's still a, because those droplets can get right, right at your face. Right at you, yeah. But yeah, I would say up until maybe a week ago, I mean, throughout most of the lockdown time, when I would go for a walk, I wouldn't even wear the mask because I was just thinking I'm, I'm far enough away from everyone that it's not going to matter. Um, and it's, uh, it's annoying wearing the mask, uh, especially if you're out for a jog or a brisk walk, you might be breathing heavier. Um, so, but then, I don't know, recently, I, I'm not even aware whether or not it's the law currently in LA that you have to wear one in public. I've heard that at one point you did, and I know in a lot of private places you do. So I want to have it with me. Um, Cause I'm almost wondering, do people feel uncomfortable around people without masks in public now? That's one thing I've been wondering. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I can see it. I can see it. And that, that's why we're having this discussion in part. Yeah. Like, well, we I see mean, it I, ourselves. I walk down the I walk down the stairs to the beach, and the stairs are only like you know about three or three and a half feet mm. wide. And if I so if I'm walking by somebody, we're definitely not at six feet. And I remember this one guy was going down the stairs, and he like looked up at me, and I felt like I felt this judging his face as he put his his bandana over his face to mm -hmm. walk by me, and I was wearing yeah. nothing but my sure. swim trunks, and I'm just like. You know? I feel I've had some some encounters like that and this yeah whenever there's like a choke point in the path like going down to the beach there's a steps and it's only like a doorways width wide and in fact they put a chain over it because the beach was closed but uh it's open again so people were just ducking under that thing but I would every time I'd walk to it there'd be like a couple of people there and they'd be like having that moment of contemplation like oh should I break this municipal rule and just go into this chain or whatever and like as i get there i'm just waiting for them to go through and i can feel like a uh, impatience rising inside me is i just like just fucking go under the cable already <laughs> don't stand there you're blocking my path um i mean and then you just wait patiently and they go uh but that's the feeling and i was like how much are other people having this feeling in general and yeah are, and i just feel like that feeling if we could get on the same page as far as I know we're not all going to have the same standards, you know, mm -hmm. some people just don't, don't, aren't as careful as other people in general. I mean, that's just a reality. Yeah, of space. True. But maybe we could establish several different tiers of protocols. You know, the people who are basically like, I don't care. Like, I, I really don't, I'm, I have nobody, no seniors I'm spending time with. I think it, it's such a statistical anomaly that it would kill me that you know, and I've got health insurance. I'm not worried about the medical bills destroying me financially. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to do whatever I need to do. And I just don't want to think about it. Okay, there's, that's that category of person. I don't want to be anywhere near that category of person right now. Um, then there's the category of people who are like, well, I'll wear a mask at the grocery store, you know, but I'm not going to wear gloves or change my shoes or you know, yeah, disinfecting gonna, groceries and all that. I'm not going to decontaminate, yeah, my groceries when I get home or or take, you know, or shed my clothes. Then there's the people who I think, or I think I'm in the maybe this second tier. Like, I, if, there, if that was, well, maybe there's a first mm -hmm. tier. You're between that second tier and the and the third tier, which you're about to describe. 
I'll describe the third tier then as okay. I, I think the third tier is people who, and I'm trying to establish now my sense of protocol and that's why I'm asking you and I want other people yeah. too, because I want to get a sense. Sometimes we're, we're being really safe in one area and then there's like this gaping hole in this other area we haven't even thought about. That's, it's like, oh, well now you've just dramatically re increased your likelihood of, of catching it in this one area because you didn't think things through rationally. And that's kind of what I'm thinking is like 80-20 rule applies in all ways, right? Yeah. 20% of the work will, re will produce 80% of the results if you're just consistent with that, that solid 20% that matters. Um, you can't make it to 100% safety, so you just, you gotta get the right 20% in. So yeah. for me, like I haven't thought about washing my face after I've been at the grocery store, but my face, even if I wore a mask, even if I had glasses on, and here's, here's my new, here's my new protocol. <laughs> so I've got my, my blue blockers and I've got my mask. And, and I like to now wear, um, I'm, and you got, and you got your hair slicked back. I got my hair slicked back. <laughs> but I think it's even better to wear a hat a hat that you can then take out. And then I wear my uh, USC a windbreaker. Fencing, my USC fencing jacket. Got to have a windbreaker. We're definitely building every serial killer from the 80s right here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I am getting some Are your glasses fogging on. up? Yeah, they are. Fogging up. Oh, we got a problem already. I may be moving too much or something, but. We need uh, windshield wipers on our glasses on the inside. Oh, OK. Yeah. Is that better? A little better, but what if you spit into the glasses? <laughs> I don't think that's going to help. I do have a little little wiper thing here, but in any case, so this is what I'm thinking. And then, I honestly I don't wear gloves anymore because I'm just going to have to throw them out. And what I do instead is I bring my bag of antiseptic wipes. I have my little travel bag with me. And in it, I always keep an extra mask and antiseptic wipes. And so basically, when I get back to the car, before I touch my, the handle of my car, I'll grab an antiseptic wipe and wash my hands. And then I'll get into the car so that I'm not spreading anything on my hands, on my steering wheel, and everything else. Yeah, I got you. So this was specifically for going to the supermarket, right? Yeah, which is where everyone, okay. just about everyone's going to have to go to the supermarket. That's the sort of the yeah, yeah, yeah. setup. So, but when I take the mask off and I put it out in the sun or, you know, take the filter out or throw it in the laundry, like my hands are the next thing that need to be washed. And then my face needs to be washed and possibly might as well just decontaminate, take everything off that you wore on your outing and take a shower. Like that's just to be the smartest protocol in my mind. Some people may see that as extreme, but to me, it's like, well, just save your shower for after your grocery shop and wear a hat because <laughs> your hair will look shitty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I've honestly had like a lot of these same thoughts and practiced some of that. Um, and I've been avoiding going to the supermarket. I've been like go doing big trips and going only like every week and a half, two weeks. Which is good for the supermarket too, because it minimizes yeah, keep, the density. Keeping the density sure. down. Yeah, I yeah. feel like I feel like I'm doing everybody a favor, including myself, by doing that, I guess. Um, yeah, so and I've, yeah, I've, I guess I've been in that same space where, yeah, when I get home, I'm like taking my shoes off right away, putting them as close to the door as I can. I even like Clorox wiped my shoes one time nice. a few weeks ago. I will say I'm energetically just like not caring as much. I'm kind of like going through these motions now. And maybe, that, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe the, the right thing to do, and maybe that's what we're trying to do here, is kind of establish what the, the protocol is and then just make it automatic and stop even thinking about it or worrying about it. Um, because there is sort of an energetic stress cost to all of this stuff, like this feeling like, ah, oh, I gotta get everything off of me or whatever. It start, it's just, I don't know, it triggers my own fear maybe or something, stress response to the point where I just feel, I feel like my body is telling me to like give up on it already. Wow. Um, and I sense that in a, maybe a lot of other people as well, too. And obviously you have some people that think this whole thing is 
is a hoax or is crazy uh, or, you know, it, it's an infringement on rights to even suggest people wear masks and stay home and things like that. So um, I'm just saying, I don't know. I, well, let me ask you how you, if you're feeling any of that too. Uh, I, I am uh, feeling, what I'm feeling is a temptation to go into apathy that this is so complicated, we don't have enough answers and it's lasting so long that it's going yeah. to be difficult to continue to deal with it without just throwing my hands up in the air. And that worries me because I've already invested nine weeks of effort into being <laughs> safe. Staying alive. I don't wanna just <laughs> throw, throw it all away, right? When we're about to go back to work and have a second spike and then all of a sudden, and, and yeah. here's the interesting thing too. Right, that's like, probably. Right now, in California, since we shut things down early, we've had so little exposure. Right now, it's probably a safer time to be mingling with people than it will be in like three months. Hmm. Yeah, you're probably right about that. There's probably going to be a yeah another peak in California, and it might be a long, slow uh, plateau right. as people go back to what is basically the necessary minimum amount of activity and economic activity so that people who can work continue to do so. Um, and there'll be probably a lot of these social distancing measures taken to lower it, but a lot of models seem to suggest there's going to be, yeah, another long wave. So, I mean, you're right, maybe now is the safe time relatively, but it's hard to know. It, pro it might just stay like this for six months nine months um, yeah and so what i'd really like is, what i'd really like and is to get to a point where we start to pair up not just pair up because i mean i'm envious of people like you who have a girlfriend who lives in a city who can like actually hey, speak spend. for yourself oh. <laughs> i'm envious of people who are coupled up already because they at least get some physical touch they get some real you know, affection time and they get, you know, I, you know, my mother and I are not that affectionate. <laughs> we're, 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 we're good. We're, we're close. Things are good with my mom, but that's not the kind of affection I'm looking for most of the time. And, um, most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it'd be nice to be able to say, okay, I'm choosing you know, these core people that I'm willing to see. And like right now, like I can tell you right now, and I, I've had to step up my game because I think I wasn't, I was not that um, germophobic before this started. I was mm. not that cautious. Um, I don't think I even washed my dishes with enough soap, according to other people's <laughs> standards, you know? Um, and now no it's- No comment. I've changed, I've changed because of this and because I care about other people's standards as well. But right now I can list a couple of friends, including you, who I'd be like, I feel, I feel like your protocol has been at least as good as mine for the last nine weeks. Neither of us have had any seeming events or symptoms that would suggest that, we, that either of us got it. I'd be willing to take the risk to visit you in person if you were willing to take the risk of seeing me in person. Is this a proposal? <laughs> no, <laughs> we don't. We don't need to. <laughs> yes, yes. Are you willing to see me in person? <laughs> are you willing? Are you gonna get down on one knee? <laughs> I need some time to think about it. Ah, <laughs> including more people in my social circle. Oh, it's such a big decision. I can't just rush into it. I need to sleep on that. <laughs> and this is this is where it brings us to this idea that it's this is a lot like AIDS in a sense that if STDs like you kind of have to ask all the questions that you would to a potential sexual partner. Have you been tested in the last month? <laughs> who have you slept with since you were last tested? You know, like, like, like who, who, have you, who have you been in a closed room with for more than 20 minutes since you were, since you were last tested? You know, it's that kind of idea, only we don't have enough tests to, to do that yet. <laughs> what are what are you doing what are you willing to do to avoid getting aids <laughs> that's the question you have to ask yourself yeah and your potential partners yeah yeah no you, that's uh that is kind of a good it's a good dark uh comparison or or yeah any S std 
we're trying to protect ourselves and be responsible. And there's a point at which it's like, wow, that's, that's irresponsible behavior. Right. Uh, like socially, we all basically agree on that. And we, yeah, it would be great if we could get to the same place on this thing. But people are at such a different place. I, I guess we, we can't really necessarily bring everybody into a global quorum during this Facebook Live, but maybe we can at least establish what we think are our comfortable protocols and then see if you guys can agree or disagree or think yeah. we're crazy. I would just we're yeah, throwing I, caution to the wind. Yeah, I'm just I am curious what other people what other people's standards are. So uh, let's establish the tier the tier four, like the top top tier that we can imagine. I'm thinking of my friend, uh, I'm not gonna mention names, but I'm thinking of a friend of mine who's, who's rather OCD. And um, I've done some, some grocery pickups for him and he will, he will keep his distance from me. There's hand sanitizer at the gate before you come in. And then he basically, you know, clean, clean room style, like has a table washes all the groceries before he brings them into the house mm, mm -hmm. you know um and yeah. and then sheds his gloves you know it's like it's like strict protocol there's no nothing getting into that house with him and his wife and so i i think that that's that's another standard level that's interesting but he's living a, a pretty contained life because of it you know he's really not not going out much with anybody he's not there's not a lot yeah. going on there that's not over the phone. Um, well, I'm obviously, why. yeah, I'm, li I'm living a very contained life too. Although I will say a few of, um, there's a few neighbors in my building complex that I'm also close friends with. And I've relaxed my, I pretty much feel like in a way we're all sort of in the same family. We're quarantining together. So I don't, I don't mind breathing the same air as them and whatever. But other than that, yeah, I haven't been going, I haven't gone to like a party or, I did go to one get together of like five people for the first time, maybe two weeks ago in, in a house, um, a dinner, you know, and uh, it was, I was like, wow, this is the first time I've been in a room with more than one other person or two other people. And how did that make you feel? In six weeks. Um, at first it was, I had a moment of tension around it, like, oh, I... I wonder if I'm going to be comfortable with this or whatever. But honestly, that quickly melted away. And I then I was actually glad to be socializing with people. Like, it felt good. Um, much needed socialization. So, th and that was cool. And I was like, oh, I made some new friends. And So, by the end of it, I just didn't care at all. Maybe there was even an, an elbow bump in there. I don't know. And... I started thinking, gosh, like most people are probably being almost as careful as I am. Um, you think so? Well, I mean, I don't know about as careful, but like just there are not that many social interactions happening right now. It'll change now that we're opening back up. And I mean, I think restaurants are still are going to be the biggest question mark going forward. Are you going to be comfortable even being in a restaurant at all? And I feel like I'm not, I'm not quite ready. And I don't want to, well, I was going to say, I don't want to discourage people from making their choices. I totally want to support local businesses, but I also, I'm like, gosh, I don't know, being in a closed room with like 50 strangers, like, those models seem to suggest if just one person had it, you know, maybe half the restaurant is getting it. And then the mask, <clears throat> you can't eat with a mask on. You can't eat with a mask on. So, yeah. You get <laughs> very difficult. Have well, some I, I have a hole. I have a hole in my mask. <laughs> right through. Easy access. <laughs> so, yeah. So, the, so we were talking earlier, like an outside cafe like might be some place mm. we consider going if it's yeah you know totally outside outtention. totally fresh air and then and it's still like you're not right next to anybody it's like sort of sparsely populated like formerly known as cafe 976 now brick and bell here in pb san diego nice. like i would go there as long as i wasn't right next to a table where somebody was sitting 
I think I would be willing to go there again at this point. Um, but yeah, I, might, I feel much more comfortable in like an outdoor cafe type setting too. I'd probably still bring a mask so that if I'm working on my computer, you know, after I'm done drinking my tea, I'm just like, all right, minimize viral load, you know, <laughs> you know just in case. But, but it depends on how many, you know, depends on proximity of people, somebody talking near me, breathing heavily, you know, considerations. I like thinking about the, the going out to the store or an event or work as a, an armor, you know, you armor up, you suit up hmm. as a warrior to go into the trenches. Cause that's what this is. And even like in New York, that might be very literally what they're do doing right now. You know, there's so many, hmm. so many cases, but here in California, since it's, it's a little bit delayed, you know, it, it may seem overly protective at this point, but it, you never know. You never know how many people are already carrying it and spreading it. So I like that it's getting into warrior mode. And then when you get home, strip it off, shed it all, let it go, shower, <laughs> and then, you know, rub your eyes, pick your nose, you know, whatever you feel like doing, lay on the ground in your home because you took your shoes off at the door. Like just let it go. And then when I'm like going outside for a walk or I'm going to the beach, and like with, within reason, I just don't want to think about it. Like I, if I, as long as I'm not near anybody who's breathing on me, I'm just going to enjoy myself. I see people with masks on in their cars and I think that's crazy. Like hmm. a beautiful day. You should have your windows down with your, with no mask. on, just going, ah, what a lovely, what a lovely day. The likelihood of you getting enough viral load through your car window is so minuscule. It's ridiculous. Yeah, you're probably right. You're probably right about that. So I don't know if we have anybody else who's wanting to weigh in on this. Does anyone else have, oh, I've got, we've got somebody viewing, Jimmy. <clears throat> Jimmy, do you have any other protocols you'd like to suggest? Which Jimmy um, is that? Jimmy Gleason. Jimmy Gleason. Friend of mine. He's Chris Brand's uncle. Nice. So, yeah, I just, you know, I think this is um, the framework. And, and so I would be, I guess I would be tier three. I'd be like pretty safe, you know? Um, and I guess we'd have to have these conversations with our, with our friends, like, like, you know, like, to establish what tier you're in, you know, what kind of safety. And that doesn't mean you wouldn't, you would never mingle with people at a different safety level necessarily, but it's like for me to feel safe, I would around people. I'd want to feel that they were at least taking things around as carefully as I was, and, you know, mm -hmm. and a, yeah. border, a border tier at least, depending on what what kind of environment we're going to be in. Yeah, and um, where where I guess this is where it's being discussed. I was going to say, will this be a conversation that happens at the beginning of the party, the get together? I would uh, hope before the you know before the bar before the get together is what I'm thinking. Like I would, if I had and the this email that goes out. Yeah, if I had this conversation with everyone who's going to be at the par a party this weekend, I might consider going to that party. But because none of this conversation has happened, and I'd have to have it separately with a, you know a dozen people, I just I'm just not sure I'm willing to do it. Yeah, let's talk about what we also talked about earlier um, on the phone, which was kind of the scenario in which it makes sense to even try to avoid getting this disease. Cause I think some people are thinking, I mean, I've, I've had the thought, it's almost inevitable that everyone's going to get this. Why even bother trying to like forestall it? You're just forestalling the inevitable or whatever. Um, but I think you brought up a very good scenario, which is like, there's a very good possibility that the hospitals are going to get, much better at treating COVID-19. Just in the next few months, we might discover some therapies that are yeah. super helpful at reducing um, yeah. deaths, especially if, if it's an immune response, which is causing the actual the death. Uh, maybe yeah. there's some drugs that can reduce right. the immune. 
like as, as many people have said, getting a vaccine for this is actually highly, highly doubtful because it's going to take a long time just to come up with the right vaccine and then to mass produce it. And we have other, other viruses that have had huge epidemics in the last 20 years that still don't have vaccines for them. So it's like, the, you know, the, maybe we come up with a vaccine, but it's probably not till next summer, if, if not later. So by the time it, we, we get from a year from now, probably everyone's going to have it already. So what's, right. it's almost like, what's the point? Unless it's yeah. a mutation or whatever, which is why scientists keep going, you know, but still, for most of us, the vaccine's not going to be the savior here. What's more likely is something, and I know hydrochloroquine has been very hotly contested and, you know, but as a malaria drug, apparently it was very helpful at stopping the, the rep replication of the malaria. So is something like that, that works best for, for coronavirus. If something probably, actually works as well as Trump touted hydrochloroquine is working right, before, right. <laughs> before anyone knew anything about it. Yeah, if something yeah. actually hits that standard of, of, of usefulness um, to stop replication in the body, that's a drug that could could be discovered anytime, like in a month, you know, and 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 yeah. and possibly used to minimize, you know, so so that and if that happened, then people could get sick and then very sick and then go to the hospital and then just stop it, rather than having this incredibly high death rate once people get to the hospital. That death rate could go down dramatically because they know exactly how to treat it. That's probably our best bet at this point. To, to, to get the deaths to drop. And if, if we get to that point, I imagine everybody relaxing all their standards, really. Um, really yeah, I mean, that, not I guess right, that does happen. Not right away, because the, the hospitals can't be overwhelmed, but, but with, you know. Yeah, it lowers the, the stakes, uh, sort of psychologically, and oh, it actually right. does lower the stakes. Uh, right. That, it's like when, I mean, same with HIV, they did start developing treatments, and I think the fear factor started to go down because it no longer seems like necessarily a, you know, a death sentence. COVID-19 is not a death sentence either, but uh, by any means, I mean, maybe 1% chance of it killing you if you get it right or somewhere 2% right. maybe, depending on your age, maybe much less than 1%, but it, still. It was in, in, in the age, yeah, in the higher age brackets, it was like a, it's close to nine or 10%. <clears throat> okay, so and I mean, that's, that's what it was, it, it could be changing, but. Yeah. So in this scenario where there's a good chance that there'd be some better therapies coming out um, sooner that we'll know more about it, that you just have a better chance of having a better outcome, then you are better off not getting it as long as possible, essentially, right? right? Which means it's better to get it in six months than tomorrow. Exactly, which means, hold, yeah, holding off the pain. In six good... months more life you can live in the meantime, yeah. at the very least. <laughs> And maybe reducing the risk for everybody else, you know, entirely because we've gotten ahead of, you know, it's, it's delaying the advance of the enemy. We're just, we're slowing the advance of the yeah. enemy so that we can that's build right. up our arsenal to defeat it. That's the whole, that's the whole game plan. And it's, it's working theoretically. It didn't work in New York. They got hit too fast. It was a blitzkrieg in New York. <laughs> so, yeah, no, you're, you're right and, and Northern Italy got blitzkrieg too. So it's like, there's, there's, and Spain and uh, France and uh, who else is on the chopping block right now? On the chopping block. Massachusetts is getting hit pretty bad. <clears throat> yeah, Brazil's getting hammered right now. Uh, so, and just, should we mention just the numbers that prove that this is way more deadly than the regular flu? Do we need to say that again for people who are doubt doubting that? New York is the only example we need. <laughs> you look at you look oh, just at the death, the death right now. Yeah, the death, yeah. the death, the death in the deaths in New York in in a two month period um, are already um, higher than the than one in a thousand deaths for the entire population yeah. of the state. That means That's it's like already that. above any seasonal flu um, by far. Um, for for a death rate, for and, they ha and it year. hasn't even saturated the population yet. And this will spread well beyond what a seasonal flu spreads. Seasonal flu spreads less than twenty percent of the population. This will spread to eighty to eighty or ninety percent of the population, most likely. 
And if the kill yeah, rate is already your 70, depending over, on when that herd immunity kicks in. Right, depending on where her herd immunity kicks in. But if that, if it's already over point, if it's already over 0.1%, that's one in a thousand, mm -hmm. then it's already way, way more deadly than the seasonal flu. And if yeah. you just say, okay, one it's just going to be, yeah. it's going to be three or four times as many people, uh, you know, infected yet in New York state, and, and we're still going to see 0.1% of those people die, then it's going to be massive. It's going to be massive, five, at least five times as, as deadly as the seasonal flu. So that's in perspective, too, though. I think that's, that's, that's yeah. bad. It's not necessarily, I don't know if we're even at cancer and heart disease levels, but it's, it's I think we're getting there in the areas where it gets to the area then yeah, I think it's, it's exceeding. It's, it's, it's becoming the number one cause of death in the areas where it's in effect. That's what I've right. been seeing. So, so yeah, like, you know, there, there's lots of questions to be asked, but is it deadlier than the flu? Yes. That's, yeah. There's just no question at this point. There's enough data like, now. Yeah, it seemed like maybe even 30 times more deadly. Like yeah. it's going to basically kill 30 times more people than the flu, which is a, a huge could be a, you know almost a million if we didn't do anything about it or more than a million in the state of new york you mean no it, i mean it could it could kill a million americans yeah, this gotcha. year essentially right um if it's uh you know if we did do no mitigation efforts and that's that's a lot it's a big number. yeah apparently about between two and three million Americans die a year of all causes. So that would, this would, that um, would be like a 30% increase in death, potentially. Yeah, that's one way to look at it. There might be some overlap of cases. It starts to be a very morbid, obviously, conversation to have. But um, yeah, that starts to be a way that my mind wants to look at it is like, well, how many how many more people is this going to kill them would it would already die i mean if it if if it kills one in a thousand americans but how many americans are one in a thousand americans over the age of 95 say or something like that so or or 100 even it's just like well everyone who's a uh, 100 is or over is going to die this year that's you know nobody wants to hear that um uh, when it's you or your gram, or your grandpa, or your dad. Um, but at the same time, it's like, well, a lot of those people are gonna die anyway. But I don't want to be cold. Yeah, about I mean, it. no. There's a lots of ways. I mean, there's lots of ways to think about this, and of course, and statistics are <clears throat> are complicated. That's why yeah. we use statistics to figure them out, and they're not human anecdotes. They're, <clears throat> but they they add up and they matter. So. Sometimes it's the only way to look yeah. at something is to use statistics to get a good picture of it. And if and if all if left you know unmitigated, for example, if all of those deaths were going to happen in say a two month period or a three month period, imagine the extreme misery in that period. Because that now you're not just talking about a third more deaths. Now you're talking about in that two month period, you know maybe five or ten times more five or 10 times more. Um, I mean, that's an extreme case, but that would, and it's already like pushing some medical systems and medical workers to the point of, to the, to the breaking point, psychologically and otherwise. Oh, okay. I've got a bright, a little bright thing to add. I gave, good. we blood, could use a little brightening up. I gave blood yesterday. Oh, very good. They were fortunate, the blood bank, San Diego blood bank was fortunate enough to not be in a little tiny, a little truck <laughs> where there's a tight, tiny enclosed airspace. Oh Instead, yeah. Although couldn't, couldn't they do it outside the truck? Couldn't they do it al fresco? I don't know. I don't know if they can do that because all their equipment's set up on the inside, but that'd be cool. Okay. In any case, they were in a different, they were in a building that they were given the space essentially at uh, Liberty Station. It's a big open, big open second floor of this building and they, had great protocol. They had a guy take my temperature before I was allowed up the stairs. Mm -hmm. And I had my own mask and I went up there and then they had me fill out paperwork and, and then they took my temperature again and my blood pressure and a bunch of other things. 
And then I sat down and I gave them red blood cells because I have high iron in my blood, even as a vegan. <laughs> <laughs> Bragger. <laughs> it was almost too high, they said, for their instruments oh, six, really? years, six years ago when I was still a heavy meat eater. But uh, yeah. it was still higher than average, even as a vegan. So I, as I was given blood, I asked, the, I asked the nurse there what, what was, you know, have they been using any blood for coronavirus? And they said, yeah, that been, they've been taking plasma from people who, who have antibodies for it. And then they can put that plasma into people who have, um, who have coronavirus. And so in some cases, it just it knocks it out. Like they're oh, out of yeah, the hospital in a few days. Convalescent plasma or something like that. Yeah. So you heard from someone that that's, that's working? That's yeah, from a nurse who was taking my blood. <laughs> nice. Well, that's, that's so a good piece of news. Yeah. I can't do that now for, for four months because I just gave blood. But <laughs> my red blood cells will go to some leukemia patient or something like that. But, but my, Are they going to give you a COVID test with that, an antibody test? No, well? it doesn't come with. You have to do the COVID separately. And if you don't have insurance, it still costs like 140 bucks. To take so, the antibody test? To just to get the antibody test. That's strange. Well, I don't know. But since I, I haven't been sick, that. since I haven't been at all, I haven't had any symptoms since this started and I've been pretty safe, I just doubt that I have had it yet. So yeah, I think so getting, getting an antibody test unlikely. would be a waste of time at this point, in my opinion. I feel you. Um, although um, that would be an interesting, the subset of people who come and give blood are already like, you know, people who are probably going to be altruistic people who are careful, maybe in general. Um, so that would be a good subset of the population to know if they had the antibodies, because if they did, they would probably be good candidates for coming and donating convalescent plasma. Because I'm sure a ton of people who get COVID and have antibodies won't be bothered to donate convalescent plasma. It'll be just like how people aren't bothered to give blood today. Uh, you know, it's an inconvenience. Some people don't like the needles or whatever. But if people are already coming and giving, what, I guess what I'm suggesting to all you politicians out there listening or Red Cross employees, I would start giving those antibody tests to everybody who comes and give blood, if you can. Can you take like a little vial? That would be a great thing to know. And I, re I researched it after I gave blood. They say there's no evidence that, that COVID can be transferred through a blood transfusion. But I'm, I'm like, are, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think just because there's no evidence doesn't mean it, it doesn't go through blood. So if you do, you know, the blood should yeah. definitely be checked before it's given to somebody. Yeah, I wonder about that too, because I heard that it can affect the blood. It can cause clotting. And yeah, blood. I heard a doctor told me that basically you can, it can you know, that the main cells that it, it seems to attach to seem to be the, the, the lining of the of the lungs. There's like a good mucosa yeah. there to attach to for the coronavirus. It's got all these receptors to chink. But that it can get much worse if it goes, if it gets, if the, if the RNA gets into the bloodstream and it goes to the heart and starts to eat up heart cells, then oh, it yeah, reduces yeah. your heart's ability to, to pump oxygen into the lungs and that's where a lot of the deaths have been happening is when it's not that the <clears throat> it's i mean pneumonia happens when your autoimmune system overreacts to the damage happening in the lungs so it's not that the coronavirus is causing pneumonia it's it's a chain reaction that causes a reaction that causes pneumonia but that's like all pneumonia i believe <clears throat> so well, i i think i heard something like what you're saying too and it was my understanding was that that something is causing you to not absorb the oxygen not necessarily just the physical fluid in your lungs but like some you might feel like you're breathing normally but you're just your blood oxygen level is way down so it could be attacking yeah. some cell that is responsible for that yeah it's oxygen a transfer so essentially your organs are, are, are oxygen starved even when you're still breathing. yeah right and that's including your brain Right. And that's where it's it was, it was strange for people at first. You're like, this doesn't make sense. Like, this isn't like, well, but it, it does if you get the big picture. Like, this is, it's, 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 it's damaging cells. You know, it's, it's, take, it's eating up cells in your organs. And that's causing you to be, to be weak and not, and not get, and sort of, get our, anyway, the oxygen starvation can actually just shut down organs before you, you stop breathing. 
the idea. So that's brought us back to a dark place. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Let's get back to the, the parties. So Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy said, uh, what about people being more lax about social distancing and businesses being opened in different states? You guys agree that that could be catastrophic? Well, that's a good question. Um, on the one hand, if we go back to the 80-20 rule, it's like it would actually make sense that every state and every community is kind of that the protocols in place there re reflect the state of the pandemic in that place. Like if there's a state where they're having, there's nobody, there's no cases, I can imagine people would be more lax there. Yeah. Whereas if there's a hot spot happening, people will have to go to level four, right? Or, you know, really be as careful as possible. Um, so obviously catastrophic in the point, if we're actually trying to like snuff this thing out and if we have a chance of doing that, um, but then we have one area that's like the weak link and the people there just can't be bothered to take the protocols and that place remains a hot spot and it keeps like, um, you know, sending, keeping the virus around for the other people, then it becomes like, yeah, okay, we can point fingers and that's the irresponsible area. But I sort of think it probably does make sense that different area, depending on outbreak level, you're gonna have slightly different um, just people naturally will have a different level of carefulness that they're willing to put up with. I don't know. Uh, what do you think, Andrew? And if you mm -hmm. want to tell us more on that, Jimmy, tell us more. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you, 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 you frame it pretty well, Michael. It's, it's, um, it makes sense. <clears throat> and, um, you know, it really, it really does matter how many people have it because then it's just much much more likely to be spread every time you go to a city center. <clears throat> um, I had a, I'm tempted to bring up that video that I saw, um, <clears throat> even though it's just a mathematical, um, the, uh, sort of hypothetical setup, this, um, this mathematician basically created a video that shows all of these, these spreading scenarios and how they, how if you go to a city center, um, everyone's going to get it. If everyone's going to that city mm -hmm. center, everyone's going to get it this from the spread. But well, if that, you, it makes sense, right? Yeah. If you contain it, though, and if you particularly if you can do contact tracing and isolation based on contact tracing, you can literally stop it. And I mm. think the problem with America is that we're just we're really too private. Like we're really not. I don't think we're willing to do contact tracing. That's a good, that's a good way to say it. Yeah. I think I would. We're not very good at co cooperating in general, I feel. <laughs> I know. And, and we're just. I mean, different. everyone's an individual on it. Everyone has a different take on this whole thing. It's hard getting everyone on the same page. Yeah. And I think, and we're also just a little, a little um, uncomfortable with being watched. <laughs> like, oh yeah, having like people take data up on us, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're right, that, that's a factor. Which is why I always drink hydrochloroquine wine. <laughs> <laughs> For its prophylactic qualities. <laughs> hydrochloroquine wine and you'll feel fine. Um, no, you don't mind that I did a plug for my, uh, my friend's hydrochloroquine wine business, do you? <laughs> no, I should have asked permission beforehand. <laughs> Do you mind if we put the website at the bottom of the screen right here? <laughs> Go right ahead. Yeah. Just kidding. Um, just kidding. Here, let me let me. You're not really gonna do it. No. No, it's I'm not. Gonna really share, I'm gonna share my. Wine. Let me share my screen real quick. So this is um, this is from three blue one brown. Um, He's a mathematician. He teaches he teaches you calculus and math on his website, his YouTube site. I mean, and here's a little quick example of of uh, the spread. So he's got what it like. Basic setup. So I have a question: Is what actions help? And then he spread? does all these other these other calculations for how it might spread. You see, he's like little little dots coming out here, and it's like this is how far it spread: six feet. And so it's like hitting all these other blue dots. But if you can quarantine people like that, then all of a sudden you really have a good chance of snuffing it out for good. 
And then he, he keeps going with all these different st mathematical situations that consider all these other factors of these yellow ones being people who can't be, who, who, no sh who have no symptoms, it's hard to test for them. Um, but the idea that we could do like major tracing and then contact uh, tracing <clears throat> in order to, to snuff it out. I mean, that's ideal, but just And not. when you say, when we're talking about removing them, I assume we're talking about assassination, right? <laughs> <laughs> like having them. <laughs> in just other putting words. People, putting people out of their misery? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we must take them out of the equation. I assume that means maybe a shelter in place, quarantine at home type situation. Quarant like quarantine, like remove yeah. you. Yeah. Although I did yeah. hear, I think in Taiwan and some Asian countries, they're actually like, moving people to these temporary quarantine housing, which I, I wonder why don't they just have them stay home? Maybe because some buildings have shared like air filtration systems or something, especially maybe in Taiwan or other countries, like they're in a big apartment tenement. And so what you're breathing out. Otherwise, why wouldn't you just have them quarantined at home? That's my question. Why don't they have them quarantined at home? Quarantine at home. <laughs> That's all you got to do. Just stay out of the general population. Like, don't go into that city center, into yeah. that supermarket. Yeah. Oh, hmm. you should also wipe your cell phone down frequently. I, I have been. Have you been wiping your cell phone yeah, down? Yeah, I have been wiping my cell phone. Although more in, like, the early days... Yeah, when I gave more Fs about everything. Now I'm kind of just like, whatever, this thing's probably going to kill me, but what do I care? <laughs> yeah, I, I just, the whole environment is not toxic. Like, we keep got to keep in mind that it's human beings that have pot are potentially are carrying this. And yeah, it can live on a surface for uh, some hours or something, right? But right, right. I mean, they say it can live on metal for days, but that I think that's only if it's in some sort of mucus or or water droplets. You know, can it survive? It literally needs to be on DNA to 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 live at all. If, as soon as the little RNA particles by themselves would be instantly dead if they weren't in, encapsulated in some sort of DNA material so um hmm. technically they're not alive they're only <laughs> they're only active when they're when they're attached to a living cell <clears throat> uh, organism so um but the but yeah like yeah surfaces for small periods of time and just the air dispersion is just you know the air dispersion is pretty pretty useful so the idea that we would clo be closing down parks and stuff. It's like, well, it'd be nice to open those parks back up so people can get a semblance of, of life again while yeah, still be being conscious not to get too close to people who play the spittle on your face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and parks are generally places where you can spread out and have enough room. I guess the, there are problems where, like in parking lots in some cases and picnic areas or maybe they're concerned about the playground equipment in some parks with kids the mm. kids spread it to each other other families and then yeah. parents of, I guess that's a consideration but in general I, personally I would say things like paths and even you know national parks any big spaces big outdoor spaces beaches I would say open them up get some people some vitamin D yeah I think so I think we should really, we could take, we could have a lot of fun with the idea hmm. that we're going into dangerous, toxic environments, <laughs> theoretically. There could be nobody yeah. in the grocery store who has it at all, and everyone's wearing a mask, and everyone's being careful for no good yeah. reason at all, but that's, you don't know. Funny. It's a funny scenario, yeah. You don't know. So yeah, that's... just assume there is somebody that has it. But I think we should play with it and have fun with the fact that we, we come home and we're like, all right, stripping off everything toxic and everything's going in the sun or in the wash, you know, and just, yeah. you know, be dramatic, jump in the shower, like, shh, you know, I gotta, rrr, gotta get all this off of me. <laughs> <laughs> Must it's get like, it clean. It's like a fun protocol that you can then set it and forget it. And then <laughs> you're, in, you're back to living your life and you had a little fun with the, with the situation that's so dark right now, you know? Yeah, that is actually great if we could have more fun with it. Um, 
try to prevent people from, you know, getting nasty with fellow human beings who are trying to be careful. That's the crazy thing is these people who are getting upset about the rules. Oh, you're going to make me wear a mask to go in the supermarket? Let me talk to your manager. Right. You know, nobody, nobody likes that person. Don't be that person. Don't be that person. You know, it's like, it's, you, don't, you don't have to think of yourself as, as a conformist to do the respectful thing for everybody else who believes this is serious, <clears throat> you know? Yeah. I wonder how it's going to be in a few months. Like, I'm so curious, is it, are we, are we going to go into the, into the mask wars, the civil wars over masks, the maskies against the no masks? <laughs> like in other words is the social tension just going to keep escalating or are people just going to like all get on the same page or <laughs> i can see the protests now <laughs> the mass was no mass no mask, yeah. Fuck you, maskers. <laughs> <laughs> they're trying to rip the mask off you're worried of crazy. dying i'm gonna kill you right now <laughs> <laughs> is this how we all is this how we go <laughs> It's funny because masks have come up in a lot of pop culture stuff lately too. Like, um, well, like the Joker movie and um, that show on HBO, uh, Watchmen, the masks wearing plays a big part in it. And then last summer, of course, there was all those protests in Hong Kong where people were wearing masks to prevent against the tear gas and to mask their mask, their identity in some cases. And that became like a symbol of the protest it's kind of crazy that like that's all that stuff is at the background. I was like, hmm, mask civil war. I can see it. That might be happening, but let's hope not. Let's all get on the same page, people. <laughs> yeah, and I. So I'm. What I'm really looking forward to because I think I think this is inevitable. Inevitably, at some point. Mask war. <laughs> yes. <laughs> at some point in the next like four months most people are going to have some sort of breakdown of just like, I can't do this anymore. I cannot be isolated this much. And yeah, they're going to I've, choose who am I willing to trust? Who am I going to spend time with? Who am I going to give hugs to and talk to for hours and just like, you know, cuddle with or be affectionate with, you know? And I don't even know, I don't even know about dating, but, but just as far as like safe circles of friends, you know, we're going to pick, we're going to pick maybe five people, 10 people, who we're willing to trust and those people we're going to be very we're going to be very very good touch with them because we want to know <laughs> we're going to want to know if somebody caught it <laughs> between between before and after our 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 visits you know well um, if there's any single ladies out there who have been very careful for the last eight uh weeks andrew shepherd would like to get to know about five to ten of you <laughs> <laughs> You got my number. That's hey, right. That's hey, who right. wouldn't? Who wouldn't? Andrew's, and Andrew's <laughs> phone number is available on Facebook. <laughs> Here on the bottom of the screen. You can, you can just text uh, PM me. No. Um, Slide into Andrew's DMs. Ladies. <laughs> but only if you're okay with masks. I wonder. Uh, we should do another talk or. or find some people that are dating in the time of coronavirus, you know? Because I know yeah, people Can we are, bring more people in on this? Can we do I would love before? that. Yeah, I'd love to get some people in who are actually telling us how they're, how they're dating. Yeah, the that'd time. be a great subject for the next... Let's get, two, let's get two guests down here in the bottom. Yeah, yeah that's what we'll do. Yeah, post well, on this thread if you'd like to be featured on our next episode, right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think that's all we got. Um, I, I, I hope that's a good starting protocol. You know, please leave comments if you're even if you're watching this not live, because I want to know what your ideas are for for a different protocol that that makes sense. I you know, certain certain things make sense and certain things don't pair well with that standard of safety. So I I you know, let's let's figure this out together. You know what pairs well with a nice quarantine meal? A great glass of hydrochloroquine wine from Trinyard Vineyards. Mmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
that pairs well with stimulating conversation. <laughs> well, Michael, well, I'm looking forward to our next talk. This has been great. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, my. Awesome. <laughs>